Amen, people of God? Amen. Amen. It should be not only the uh, lyrics or words upon our lips that Christ would be magnified to us today through the reading and the preaching of his word, but it should also be the cry of our hearts. I invite you, if you have a copy of the scriptures, to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We are in a detour from the gospel account recorded for us by the Apostle John. A brief detour, but a detour nonetheless. 1 Timothy chapter 3, we will consider together verses 14 through 16. Before we hear from our God through the reading and the preaching of his most excellent word, let us go to him yet again in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God and most magnificent Father, we thank you that you have given us this most pure word. Words from you, O oh Lord, that are excellent. Words from you that are good. Words that are a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So be pleased, our Heavenly Father, to illumine the Scriptures to us, that our hearts might receive these words from you, and that we might live accordingly. Help us to that very end, we pray. And we ask all of these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the very name into which we were baptized. And all God's people said, and amen. 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning... In verse 14. These things I write to you, hoping to come to you in short time. But if I delay, so that you know how it is necessary to conduct oneself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and mainstay of the truth, and indeed, great is the mystery of godliness, who was revealed in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in the world, taken up into glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks, indeed, beloved, thanks be to our most excellent God. Today... As I already indicated, we are beginning a short but new series. And the title of this series is The True Care of Souls, which I confiscated from the 16th century theologian Martin Bucer, who wrote a treatise outlining the qualifications and the way in which elders and pastors should oversee the church. In each chapter of this treatise, he highlights something different. He exposes yet another aspect of pastoral ministry that is here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And as he goes through hospitality, as he goes through doctrinal fidelity, as he goes through all of these different things, wouldn't you know that he not only focuses on the call and qualifications of the elder or pastor, but he also, toward the end of the treaties, takes a brief look at you. As he articulates for us how the congregation should respond to the elders of the church. And in doing so, he reflects upon Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them as those who have to give an account for the care that they have over your souls. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for it would be of no benefit to you. It's the kind of passage that would clear out a room of self-righteous people who think that they do everything almost perfectly when it comes to how they interact with those who oversee the church. Though he focuses on the congregation's response to the church, the vast majority of the treaties deals with how the church should elect and ordain office bearers. Who is called? 
Why are they called? Is it just some feeling that someone gets because it seems like it's a good thing? And if a person is called, should they go to every graduation? Do they have to attend every soccer game? Do they have to visit people in the hospital? Do they have to visit people in their homes? What are the characteristics of those who are called to shepherd the sheep? In the next several weeks, Lord willing, we will give some time to looking in to those questions. Today, we are focusing on verses 14 through 16 in 1 Timothy 3, which is the heartbeat of this entire epistle. Everything in this epistle, whether before it or after it, pulsates from these several verses. So we start here. And we start with this message, which I've entitled, as you notice there, <laughs> Code of Conduct. Did you see verse 15? That Timothy, the recipient of this epistle, needs to know how it is necessary to conduct oneself in the house of God. Paul is outlining for him, here's the code of conduct, young Timothy. This is the way that you ought to behave yourself when it comes to shepherding the sheep. Everyone has a code of conduct, right? Uh, growing up, my mother made sure that if I was speaking to someone who was older than me, I addressed that man or that woman as sir, ma'am, miss, or mister. In a day and age where everyone wants to be addressed by their first name, that didn't have any play in my household. It was always giving respect to those who are older. Uh, there were other things in my house as well. Of course, I had to be, and not of course, but at least for black families, some of y'all understand. You had to be inside when the street lights came on. Uh, there were other things that my mother raised me knowing and thinking about education, about traveling, about how I interacted with her. And there are things that also evolved in one in, in my marriage. When I was growing up, I can keep my shoes on in the house. My wife doesn't have time for that. So we have a code of conduct even in our own households, at least our new household, my wife and me. Paul is the author of this epistle, writing to Timothy, its recipient. And Paul met young Timothy when he was on one of his missionary journeys to Derby and Lystra. And there he heard about this disciple, Timothy, who had a good reputation among the brothers. And so that was the very person that Paul wanted to go with on his missionary journeys. But interestingly enough, Timothy was a half-breed, to use the language. Timothy was an interracial child. His mother was Jewish. His father was Greek. And though Paul was a Jew of Jews, he still selected Timothy to go with him on that trip. Talk about cross-cultural ministry. Talk about engaging those who are unlike you. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him. And though young Timothy escorted him on various aspects of Paul's missionary journey, Timothy ultimately found himself here in Ephesus, pastoring the church. And so he's there in Ephesus dealing with the realities and the harshness of pastoral ministry. And so Paul, verse 14, says, I write these things to you. What things? You need to know how to behave yourself, Timothy, in a world that despises you. What things? You need to know how to conduct yourself, Timothy, when you're in a church that thinks they have their doctrine together, though yet the church is actually a part of the ones who despise the doctrine of God. What things? You need to know, Timothy, how to deal with difficult church folk. Church folk can be difficult, right? And I tell you what, if your response, along with saying amen, was, yeah, they can be difficult, you've missed the point. 
Timothy needs to know how to conduct himself. So Paul writes these things so that he knows how to handle those things. When there are statues created in Ephesus to other gods and people will walk around saying, great is Artemis of Ephesus. He needs to know how to deal with those things when people in his community are demon-possessed. He needs to know how to deal with false teachers in his church that want to extend their doctrine on the basis of endless genealogies and myths. You need to know, young Timothy, how to deal with those things. So here is your code of conduct. I will outline for you your behavior so that you have no questions. If God calls a man to his church, he's not going to leave him without instructions regarding how to oversee his church, his property purchased by the very blood of Jesus Christ. So provided all of that is true, when was the last time you read this epistle to see if those who are caring for your souls are actually doing an appropriate job? I don't know if any of you have heard of Douglas Goodwin. Popular preacher in the late 90s, early 2000s, a British preacher, right? So he has a little bit of extra credibility because of his accent. But his church was growing. As a matter of fact, it was one of the fastest growing churches in the UK. He was known as one of the best evangelists in the UK. But in 2004, he was convicted of several charges of sexual harassment. All of those people trusting that this was the man of God, called by God to ensure that the church was shepherded appropriately, and yet he was convicted of sexual harassment. Long before hashtag me too, there were people in the church harassing people who were in the church. Neglecting the very words of God that should have upheld them so that they know this is off limits. And whether you like it or not, those men who are in the pulpits or in the limelight somehow are the face of the church. And when those men fall, the reputation of the church also falls. Convicted of, I think, four accounts of sexual harassments against people. Notice what I said. People. I didn't just say women. You heard of Eddie Long? Bishop Eddie Long, as he's called? A church right outside of the Atlanta area was the one that he said he was called to oversee. 25,000 people on the membership roster, that's a mega church. And yet he was charged of sexually molesting young boys, little boys. He would take them to his house on the hills or when he would open up another campus for his church and they would escort him and then it comes out that he had been molesting them. Before he died, apparently he settled out of court. Are these men not reading this epistle that Paul wrote to young Timothy? on how to conduct themselves sexually, on how to conduct themselves emotionally, on how to conduct themselves intellectually. It's as if this was never written. Paul said to young Timothy, I write these things to you. Don't neglect it. Bind them upon your hearts so that you know how to behave because the world doesn't like you. People in the church don't like you. But if you can obey my rules given by God, at least you can stand before the Lord with a clear conscience. I write these things to you, Timothy. But was it just because he needed to have a refresher, as it were, regarding his behavior. (laughs) Is that it? Uh, Was it just because perhaps young Pastor Timothy needed some encouragement? 
I suspect it was also something else. I know you've heard enough of my Navy stories, but I'd much rather tell you those than something about the Army or the Air Force. That'd be boring. So I'll tell you another one. One of the things that the Navy gets right is that it collects people from all cultural, socioeconomic, and ethnic backgrounds. And when you go into boot camp, whether it's boot camp for officers or boot camp for enlisted, the leaders of that company, the leaders of that battalion have to take all of those different kinds of people with all of their different kinds of experiences and somehow make them into one community, thinking the same thoughts. And so they have to break you down, refashion you, and build you back up. And one of the ways they did that was giving us a greater sense of community. I became we. Me became us. They gave us common core values, honor, courage, and commitment. So that we know we can then look around at everybody else and say, you believe what I believe and we're in this fight together. But despite being broken down and being built back up, we all still struggled from one and the same thing. You know what it was? Loneliness. I mean, you would think that with a bunch of people who were thinking the same things, there wouldn't be anyone who was lonely. But we were lonely. And it wasn't just because we were away from family and friends, right? Most of us, at least when I was going through boot camp, weren't from Chicago. We were from all over the U.S. But we were lonely not just because we were separated, again, from family and friends, but we were lonely because there was a certain amount of isolation in what we were doing. No matter the letters that we would receive from family and friends, which we really, really wanted, we were still isolated. Isolated because less than half of 1% of the U.S. population enrolls or enlists in the military. So no matter what letters we receive or no matter how many conversations we have with others, they still could not relate. We were lonely because no one could empathize with us. The pressures of having to deal with your own command, the pressures of having to deal with this entire nation, the pressures of what people think and what they're going to say about you. We were lonely. I suspect that another reason Paul would write this epistle to Timothy is because he was lonely. In a church where many people believe the same things he believed, yet none could empathize with him because of the calling that he had upon his life. Because he was in the spotlight. He was the one who was criticized by all, and yet people would rarely tell him that he was doing a good job. If less than half a percent of people are enlisting or enrolling in the military, less than half of half of half a percent of people are in pastoral ministry. Loneliness. So Paul wrote, I'm coming to you, Timothy. I know what it's like. You remember, Paul, what he wrote in 2 Corinthians 11? He had a lot going on, right? I mean, he uh, shipwrecked uh, 40 lashes minus one on a number of occasions. He was beaten. Get this. The Jewish people didn't like him because he converted. The Gentiles didn't like him because, well, well you were the ones who used to uh, persecute us. So he's just sitting in the middle there, has no relationships now because everybody despises him. He's traveling all over the place trying to get the message of the good news out. Yet, for example, in Ephesus, people are willing to riot because they don't want that message spread. Paul is being hurt from the outside. He's being hurt from the inside. On top of that, he has to deal with his own personal sin. And he said, though I deal with all those things daily, daily, I have to deal with the anxiety that I have because of the churches. All of those other things... The shipwrecked, the being beaten, people talking about me. I can't trust people because they feel like that I'm some type of imposter. All that stuff is here and there. But daily, 
I have to deal with the burden because of the anxiety I have for the churches. Timothy, I understand and I'm coming to you. But I might delay. He says that in verse 15 and I don't think it was I might be delayed. Remember when he was on one of his missionary journeys, the spirit of Jesus, we're told in Acts, would not allow him to go to a certain place, so he had to go around and go to Troas. No, no, no. He's not saying here, I will be delayed. He's saying that there could be some other things that I have to wrap up before I come to you. But still know that I am coming to you so that I can empathize with you, Timothy. I am coming to you so that I can encourage you regarding the things through which you're going. I am coming to you, Timothy. But in the meantime, read this epistle. Read this letter that I have written to you, my true spiritual son. 1 Timothy 1. So that you know how to conduct yourself. But do you want to know, Timothy, the heartbeat of that conduct? Do you want to know, Timothy, the catalyst for that conduct? What should drive your behavior? It's not the law, like some of these other false teachers say. If you were to go back to chapter 1, you would read how people were trying to use the law in a way that Paul had not passed down to the churches. And they're trying to use that as some catalyst for your, your godliness. And while the law is good, Paul says, when used lawfully, the law itself is not going to produce in you godliness. It will show you where you fall in short when it begins picking apart the very good things that you thought you did. Many preachers are known as saying even your repentance needs to be repented of. There is nothing in us that merits absolute purity. And so the law will be a light unto our path and it will help us to know how we ought to live, but at the end of the day, our good works are not going to somehow make us more godly because the more godly you become, the more you realize that your good works actually aren't good. So Timothy, we, Paul wrote, need to work out what the genesis and the catalyst is for your godliness. Because I tell you one thing, can I speak from my heart? One of the most difficult things in pastoral ministry is not those folks out there. It's the folks in here. It's the folks who say they are walking by faith, not by sight, and they want to serve the body, and none of that is actually happening. That's what causes me sleepless nights. That's what keeps me on the phone all the time. That's what makes it such that when I go on vacation, I can't stop thinking about what's happening in here. Because I know what's in your heart. Because it's the same thing that's in my heart. And yet I've been called to oversee not just my own heart, not just my family's hearts, but all of yours too. And that is a weight. But you see, it's not just a matter of orthopraxy, right? It's not just a matter of, oh, uh, you yelled at your sibling or, or, or you broke up with your fiance or, 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 or you, you know, broke up with your girlfriend. It's not just a matter of orthopraxy. It's also a matter of orthodoxy because it's sound doctrine that Paul is encouraging Timothy to ensure his people understand that I too have to ensure you understand. If you don't have sound doctrine, you're not going to have sound practice. So with all of the ways that we can get a hold of different doctrinal teachings, it's no longer just some false teachers, 1 Timothy 1, going around trying to coerce a few Christians here and there to believe certain things about myths and endless genealogies and the law. We got to deal with Twitter, yeah. 
Facebook, MySpace, different blogs, CNN, Fox News, all of these things are presenting to you some theological picture. And I'm trying to figure out what you are being presented with so I can help shepherd you through those things. I can only imagine there's some stuff on your bookshelves that because you have not been given the spiritual discernment to understand what's good and not, you've been believing some things that are false. I can only imagine how some of you who consider yourselves doctrinally astute have some races on your shelves. But you'll just look right by that because, well, they're reformers, right? False prophets, self-proclaimed apostles, women preachers, all of that stuff just on your shelf. Do you know who bears the burden of trying to help each and every one of you work through those things? There's only one of me. Paul wrote to Timothy, I get it. So I'm coming to you. But you know, that burden, and more specifically, the thrust that those who are called to pastoral ministry need, isn't just in more work. It's not in writing books speaking at conferences. It's not at going to every event. Those things at the end of the day might make a pastor or an elder look good in the eyes of the people, but at the end of the day, at the conclusion of it all, what will catapult him into doing the things that God has called him to do? That's what Paul wrote in verse 16. Great indeed is the mystery of godliness. It was that thing that was hidden for so long now revealed. And whatever was hidden now revealed, that is going to be the impetus. That is going to be what catapults you to live godly. It's not the law. It's not in everybody's encouragement telling you how great you are. Those things might be good, but there's only one way. There's only one source. There's only one electrical socket you can plug yourself into to walk this godly life, even when no one's around. And it's when he, that is the Christ, revealed himself in the flesh. Some suggest this is a hymn, that is a song. You know, songs have certain rhymes and certain cadences and certain verses and stanzas are together and uh, the same is true of this. You can divide this verse into two sections or three sections. You can look at it as Jesus' ministry pre-resurrection, Jesus' ministry post-resurrection. You can look at it as couplets, kind of opposite, for example. Uh, the Christ was manifest or revealed in the flesh and he was vindicated by the Spirit and so it's his birth coming into the world and his resurrection. I mean, there are as many ways to dissect this alleged hymn as there are ideas. Yet if you want that fuel, Paul wrote to Timothy, to continue working through the difficulties of ministry, this is it. That he was revealed in the flesh. That the Son of God took up residence in the womb of the Virgin Mary and nine months later, he became the center of attention again. On the throne, he was the sinner. In the womb, nobody really knew. But when he came out of the womb and was put in that trough, he became the sinner again. Mary was amazed. Joseph was amazed. People traveled from all over to see him and offer gifts. And what they saw as a little infant was God in the flesh who spoke the heavens and the earth into existence but now couldn't say a word. There he was. God encased in humanity who couldn't speak. And yet, however you interpret this section in verse 16, it goes on that that same God who was and is also man was taken up in glory. The fuel for ministry, the fuel for persevering, 
When people go astray, the fuel for persevering, when you get those unwanted text messages and emails and having those hard conversations, the fuel is right here. That there is a God who loved you enough not simply to call you into ministry, but to give of himself as an infant and then taken up into glory after he bore their sins, our sins, your sins in his body upon that tree. And says to you, you're forgiven. And says to you, you are invited into the household of the living God. Do you notice that here? One of the only places the church is expressed that way. The household of the living God. Artemis in Ephesus is dead. This God is living. And it's through him you have life, people. It's through him that you can be sustained. It's through him that you are loved. It is through him that you are cared for. That's why Paul would encourage and demand of Timothy that when he oversees the church, he has to give them this thing, the deposit, the truth of Jesus, which will be the only thing that will sustain any of you. When you're dealing with a hard spouse, and yes, you spouses are hard-headed, when you're dealing with unruly children, when you're dealing with people in the church that you don't want to talk to, when you're dealing with sisters and brothers that have issues, when you're dealing with life, your employer, the only thing that's going to sustain you is this mystery of godliness that will enable you to stay calm, knowing that no matter what happens, God is on the throne. And interestingly enough, he dethroned, didn't he? And then took his rightful place again when he ascended pastors need to hear this young Timothy needed to know this that really you have one hope it's in the Christ of the message that will enable you to live godly it will make you more and more like Jesus so how then ought we to dissect verse 16 So many ways. He was revealed in the flesh. That could be the Son of God became a human. That could be the Son of God took up residence in this fleshly or earthly sphere. He was vindicated in or by the Spirit. This could be a chronology of Jesus' ministry when the incarnation took place and then he went out and he was baptized by John the baptizing one and the Spirit descended upon him. It could be that. It could be he was vindicated by the Spirit in his resurrection when God declared, you have done nothing wrong. He was seen or looked upon by angels. Could be during his wilderness wanderings when after he defeated that wicked liar, Satan, the angels came and ministered to him. It could be after he rose from the dead and the angels were there. Which is it? Proclaimed on among the nations. That's good news for Timothy, who wasn't even circumcised until Paul told him to get circumcised so that he wouldn't be an offense to the Jews. That's good news for Timothy, whose mother may have been through her lineage at the base of Mount Sinai receiving the law, but his father was a Greek. That's good news for Timothy, who was an interracial child. And it's good news for you. The good news wasn't developed in Europe during the Reformation. The good news came from a good God out of the mouth of a Hebrew man for all people, from all nations. It's good news that this good news was proclaimed among in the nations. Believed on in the world's more good news that the message of the people of the way, as they were called in the book of Acts, the message of, of hope that comes only from Christianity was believed on in the world. It didn't, just didn't stay in that little space over there in the Near East somewhere. It went out to all peoples. Good news. As it trickled down over the years to even come to your ears good. and yours. Right. Taken up in glory. Do you remember Jesus' response 
when he spoke to the disciples in John's Gospel, chapter 14. Before he would ascend to the right hand of his father, he said something akin to, if you knew what was happening, you would rejoice. Taken up into glory. We can rejoice with that because Jesus has taken his rightful place on the throne at the right hand of God the Father. And there he, along with the Holy Spirit, intercedes for us. And as we will confess momentarily, he's coming back to get us. Good news. So whatever we do with this hymn, if that's what it is, it is the message, it is the catalyst, it is the genesis of our godliness. Yes, broadly the church, but more narrowly pastors, so that we have something to catapult us through the thick of ministry. This, Paul would say to young Timothy, I write these things to you. I write these things so that you know how to deal with those things. And this is how you ought to behave no matter the circumstances that come your way so that you might be blameless before God as father and judge but also so that the church's reputation would be maintained. Over the next several weeks, Lord willing, we will consider how God's church ought to function as young Timothy, at the beginning of chapter 3, was called to appoint both elders and deacons, those who could bear some of the burden of the weight of ministry, though they'll never fully understand. It's still good to give away some of that burden so that others can serve the church. What are the qualifications of those elders? What are they called to do? And what about the deacons? Are deacons some second-class citizen, as some people like to think of it? Or is their office and calling good and necessary for the church? Pray with me. Pray for me as we consider this epistle, ultimately, so that we better understand the true care of souls. Amen? Amen. Amen.